So I'm not editing this one, so it's up to you to put this cold open in, Ben. Mm -hmm. Boy, there sure was a lot more typewriter f than I expected. Intro music goes here. So that's the... Um, that's it. Words about books, that, baby. I'm Nate, you're the, Ben, you, Garth Marenghi, and the typewriter fucking. You messaged me at like 1pm today and you're like, don't worry, I got an intro. <laughs> it's a cold open, Ben. It, it's a cold it open. Aptly, it aptly describes to the listener what they're about to get into. It's a horror novel that has way, way, way more uh, man on typewriter action than expected. Uh, yeah. I think that's... <laughs> which, which you usually don't expect anyway. So Yeah, I mean, that's safe to say. Uh, so, I'm Ben. He's Nate. We're talking about uh, Garth Marenghi's Terror Tome by Garth Marenghi. And um, I had never heard of this person. But upon reading the book... Um, well, I guess let me just walk you through my experience from start to finish here. <laughs> okay. And there was a poll. I lost. This yeah. was chosen. Yep. I hope you got destroyed. I hope you're all gonna really enjoy what's coming. Um, <laughs> you might though, because I actually like this book. But uh, I didn't know anything about this. I don't know who Garth Marenghi is. Well, I didn't know who Garth Marenghi was. Um, I didn't know who Matthew Holness was. We'll get to him in a minute. I still don't know who that is. I was sitting here not reading this book. I was reading other books. And I just keep getting texts from Nate like, <laughs> wow, there's a lot of this guy f this typewriter. I didn't know there was going to be this much of a guy f this typewriter. Boy, it sure does go on. <laughs> so then I started reading it and I was like, huh, this is a lot of a guy having sex with his typewriter. I'm going to plug another podcast. If, if, if you like, if, if you're attracted to, the, to the, the, the sexual aspect of this book, Nuzzle House. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, there is a podcast uh, on uh, Nuzzle House, uh, Nuzzle House's feed that he does with his wife called Gestating the Curious Mind, where they write paranormal smut. They just do it live on air. I mean, the writing. Yeah, among other things. Yeah, like drinking. <laughs> <laughs> they drank some disgusting wine. It sounded terrible. Uh, and then they wrote Paranormal Smut. It's about a man who has a werewolf for bleeping every other word this episode. I guess I should make it an explicit episode. Probably. Probably good. Good call. It reminded me very much of, a, of an episode of Gestating the Curious Mind. So I got a little bit into this, and then I decided I was like, I need to know more about this. So... That launches me into the about the author, because you really can't talk about Garth Marenghi without talking about a, a strange, uh, let me check my notes, British man named Matthew Holness. Now, Matthew Holness is the man behind the glasses. Uh, that is the sketch comedian who came up with the character of Garth Marenghi. Garth Marenghi predates Cecil H.H. H. Mills, but his books don't, so that's interesting. Very weird, right? Yeah. Garth Marenghi's Dark Place came out in 2004. So Garth Marenghi's Dark Place is a six-episode television series that is many layers of satire. Greetings, traveler. I'm Garth Marenghi, horror writer. Most of you will probably know me already from my extensive canon of chillers, including Afterbirth, in which a mutated placenta attacks Bristol. Back in the 1980s, I wrote, directed and starred in Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, a television programme so radical, so risky, so dangerous, so goddamn crazy, that the so-called powers that be became too scared to show it and jit me, much in the same way that women have done ever since they sniffed out my money. So Garth Marenghi himself is a horror author who may or may not be successful he has quote written more books than he's read and he uh the the plot of the show is that in 
the 80s, the author Garth Marenghi and his f- publisher, played by Richard Ayoade, decided to make a hospital supernatural soap opera called Dark Place. And that this soap opera was never aired because it was too edgy, too ahead of its time. And only now has it been rediscovered. And throughout the episodes, Garth Marenghi uh, presents interviews with himself, uh, the, the publisher character, and that guy from the IT crowd. Listen to me. I am not prejudiced, all right? That is what I'm saying. I am not prejudiced. But Joe Public is. You probably are. You look like a dropout. Point being, I wrote this to heal Britain. Um, Scotch missed some thought was fairly racist. I didn't, to be honest. Um, thing is, I play anything. Uh, a Nazi. Anything at all. I never, I don't think I'd ever kiss another man. Um, you know, not even for the, you know, the big boys. Who also has a book, as well as Ayuadi. Toast on Toast. <laughs> Yeah, I heard about that. And and there's an actress who they constantly shit on, and it's implied very heavily that, uh, that the publisher killed her. It's so hard to watch this episode, knowing that she's now missing, presumed dead, with the presumption heavily on dead. I don't think they'll find anything. But then again, she was like a candle in the wind. Unreliable. Yes. I don't know... Anything I, I can't find anything about the Garth Marenghi character from before the show The Dark Place. It's because he didn't exist before The Dark Place, except for in Matthew Holness's deranged dark mind. Did you know Matthew Holness went to Cambridge? And so did Richard Ayoade? Yeah, Iwati? yeah so I did, did because um, you told me that. Who's the one you'd, you'd believe that? Uh, David Mitchell. David Mitchell went to Cambridge. Which one is David Mitchell? Uh, if you ever watch, like, Would I Lie to You? He's the posh one. I know you'd know him if you saw him. Okay. He's the he's the Are We the Baddies guy. That Nazi sketch where he's like, We, we wear skull and crossbones. Are we the baddies? Oh, okay. Yeah, he's a, he's a guy. So he's, he's, this, is, this guy's from that batch. So what's so special about Cambridge, other than it's been around for fucking ever? Oh, Stephen Hawking taught there. I mean, oh. not the sketch comedy department. I don't, well, I don't know that he didn't teach the sketch comedy department. Well, for 1,500 but. gold, you can construct the college in Crusader Kings 3, then. Oh, yeah, I think colleges in not America are different. Yeah. Like, there's a university, works. and each yeah. university has many colleges. Is that how that works? I don't know or care because look my 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 forefathers didn't fight a war so that i have to know these things okay my forefathers didn't fight a war so i had to know what a college was you got all right right. (laughs) all right america america I have the freedom to not understand higher education. That's one of the that's one of the ticks against Garth Marenghi. Not American enough. It is a tick, yeah. <laughs> Cecil H. H. Mills is, is American, so yeah. that's that's one against Merck. Them. But I do like the kind of British Garth Marenghi is. I don't know what that <laughs> accent is. Uh, okay. What's that? It's, he sounds like one of the Beatles. Like Hopefully not Ringo. I was a doctor in Actually, hopefully not the hospital. Lennon. Aren't they all from the same place? Aren't they all from Liverpool? Is it Liverpool? I've, I don't know. Good soccer team. Terrible though they call food. it football. Um, oh, hey, so, look yeah. at that. Oliver Cromwell went to uh, the University of Cambridge. Wait, Cromwell. That's relevant. Because, oh, fuck him. <laughs> because they kept saying, I swear to Crom in Ready Player Two. And that's who they were talking about. Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> the fucking traitors. <laughs> okay, so the reason I bring all this up, I was I started researching for my my about the author. I watched every extant episode of Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, and it was quite funny. I actually yeah, I actually liked it a lot. Pretty I'm good, sad. right? I'm sad yeah, it got welcome. canceled. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, that was actually a, a solid, a solid little show. I understand it aired on Adult Swim in the States. Did it really? 
Yeah, that's what because my wife had seen it. I sat down to watch it. And she's like, she's like, oh, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, and I was like, yeah. Uh, apparently like that was on the mighty i knew the mighty boosh was on adult swim but i, oh, I guess yeah. garth Marenghi's i never dark watched place the mighty there. boosh though but noel fielding uh is in the dark place one episode as uh a man ape he's also in the it crowd well yeah as a vampire <laughs> as a goth there's a difference we listen to cradle of filth Okay, what else was I going to say? Okay, Gar- Garth Marenghi, Matthew Holness. Okay, so I'm doing my about the author research, right? So I listened to a couple of interviews with Matthew Holness. It made its U.S. debut on the Sci-Fi Channel, Ben. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't. I I believe I told you this was a second-hand account. Yeah. Into your research. Editor Ben here even though it may have made its debut on the sci-fi channel in America, it did in fact air on Adult Swim in 2007 as part of the network's Brit block. Fuck you, Nate. Okay, so there's there's a podcast I was listening to. I think it is RHLSTP with Richard uh, Herring. I don't know who that is, but I listened to his podcast because it contained like one of the only interviews with this dude specifically about this book. And who Matt, Matt or Matt, Matthew Holness. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't, I couldn't find a lot of interviews specifically related to this book. So obviously I feel like Garth Marenghi was created for the show. The show was co-written by Richard Ayuadi and directed by Richard Ayoade. So it seemed like kind of a, I, I don't know how much of the initial concept is Matthew Holness versus um, the other people working on the show. And when he he opens up this interview and I, I got to be honest with you, I, I can't tell because I don't know the guy. But one of the things about Garth Marenghi is he's, he's a, a sort of up his own ass writer thinks everything he writes is like really good and really highbrow really intellectual challenging the status quo and then of course the joke being it's not it's often just racist misogynistic uh (laughs) stupid that's the status quo ben (laughs) (laughs) yeah but he's not challenging it he is it (laughs) and it, it also like exists to like make him grander to like make make him a bigger man uh like like we've talked about with um, the the Game Grumps books, the Cecil H. H. Mills character, it's it's a pompous writer, and he he wrote this show, and and one of the jokes in the show that's just an ongoing thing is that he wrote the show. So there's there, like in the first episode, there's this like eight year old boy who's like, uh, they work you too hard around here. You deserve a hero's wage, and it's and he just nods and walks out of the room and. So that's the kind of that's the kind of guy this is. So Matthew Holness opens up the episode uh, of this podcast, and he's like, "Yeah, everything they put on TV is, is just like shit these days, and you can't make any money in TV." And like, he's just like lamenting, like like this big boomer energy of like the state of television. Like, he should go on strike. <laughs> who the hell cares about broadcast television? This Nobody's guy. watching television. I guess maybe because he's like all the he's like I, they want to own I'll all the I'll watch television and... as soon as I get cable, Ben. <laughs> I think I may have summarized the problem right there. Huh? Well, yeah, and so he's like all these all these studios want, and I'm not look, I'm, I'm not on the studio side here. It's just he comes on like I'm an underappreciated genius. Yeah, he's Garth Marenghi. Well, and middle that's name kinda, Lemon. Like, like, is he Garth Marenghi? Like, I, I I don't know. I I just got this vibe that like I can't tell if you're joking or not. I can't tell if you're aware of like the irony here, the big of, Garth <laughs> energy <laughs> of your character versus how you're coming off right now. <laughs> like, oh, like, 
I can't make a living in television because they don't appreciate, you know, quality entertainment. They don't appreciate new ideas. And then it's like in my head, I'm like smash cutting to those six episodes of Garth Marenghi's <laughs> Dark Place I just watched uh, where he like the joke is he punched a woman in the face because she's a woman. And I'm like, OK, you might be <laughs> like it was funny, but like <laughs> I, I don't know if. <laughs> OK, yeah. And so uh, he mentioned like he hadn't done anything with Garth Marenghi because he didn't know like if he had the rights to the character. He was very vague about it, but he made it seem like maybe he didn't know if he could do it or if he'd be allowed. But as it turns out, he was allowed and he was thinking about getting into books. He has written other stuff, but he wanted to do this character as this book because he thought it was a like piece of art he could control the way he wanted to. He wanted to have like full creative control and he didn't want anybody else to own the IP or the character. He wanted his work to be his work. And, you know, so you just leverage all your industry connections, get a publishing deal and yeah, bang zoom. That's how it works. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's writing Garth Marenghi's Terror Tome, uh, which again, high art i mean he's he's like at the 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 monty python of fake horror writers this guy so yeah i mean back when Mon monty python was good i guess they're still kind of around embarrassing themselves that might be a controversial statement maybe i'll cut it no nah, fuck them and <laughs> what? uh, what's the controversial <laughs> well like is it like is it controversial that monty python should like stop that it should stop like performing like fans or oh is it still performing i don't know they had a show like uh, a couple years back where they're all old and they're on stage mm. and they're singing songs about penises and i'm just mm. like this is sad yeah i mean it was <laughs> revolutionary at the time when they didn't have a lot of censorship um and and they were and, all still and, alive and and it was it was uh, made significantly less funny when every asshole who uh, was described in Ready Player One to a T as just like oh I memorized all the lines of the Holy Grail and I just kept saying them and it's like yep thanks for ruining it it's bad now yeah. you made it bad yeah, yeah it's bad now. I I used to enjoy it but you said knee four hundred times and now now it's bad now it's cringe. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So this is how we come to get this book. So he, he reasons to himself he can write a book and you can make some money on a book. Like he, he mentions he's written short stories and stuff, but you can't really make a lot of money on a short story. And again, he's, he's just he talked a lot about the business plan, which I actually do find interesting. By the way, I, I do like it when authors talk about how they make money because I also want to make money. Well, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> mind it. And Can for a I lot of like, also get the money for being an author. <laughs> for for a lot of a lot of people who are trying to get into writing, they are never going to be Stephen King. They are never going to be Sarah J. What? Moss. They're never like the, the I, number of I, authors I, who I'm, make a living is none, basically. I, <laughs> um, I'm I'm willing to settle for. Um, uh crap hold on hold on uh bella Mackey. can can i get bella Mackey levels of <laughs> no <laughs> can i no can she I got that she got that connection? born rich publishing deal uh if you're born rich <laughs> can i get some connections about uh that that will get me a deal and then like i can write a book about how much i hate rich people is your uh, uncle in a literal fucking aristocracy in the 20th 20, century? Yeah, no, century? I guess I guess my my grandfather isn't a fucking baron, so I can't. Yeah, so probably not. My my grandfather was a poor dirt farmer, fucking idiot. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so he talks about how he could make money. So, the way he's making money on this, he's selling the books, he's selling the audiobooks. He performs the audiobook he also is on a book tour, which the book tour, as I understand, is more of a comedy performance than a book tour. Okay. So, for example, 
the tickets started at like 60 pounds for this. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Do I get so, a signed copy of the book and also like a signed picture that we take together and you oh, now, like actually might I don't know what around? the details are. Maybe so I don't know what part? the details are. But <laughs> okay. he um Does he come to the states where people actually have money to spend and matter? No, it's mostly no. A, a UK tour. Oh. Okay. Uh, and uh but he dresses up, he he does the book tour in character. He performs a, a um, modified reading of one of the stories, I think, modified for time. So he tells well, like yeah. a complete story. But yeah, so this uh, he's recently released a second book. So that's um, that's what we're dealing with. Garth Marenghi is a multimedia project juggernaut, titan, an innovator. Some might say a revolutionary, it, perhaps plus actor. Jiu-jitsu black belt. Oh, I never got that that feeling. Oh, uh, did you not it. watch Dark Place where like every time they go down a hall, they like square up with their karate chop hands? <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> but then and then Garth Marenghi, as a you know, as a as a medical doctor, takes out his gun. I never miss a musical of the starlight, and if anyone thinks that makes me less of a man, they can talk to my fucking gun. But uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much the about the author. I think that's all you really need to know. I don't think you need to watch Dark Place to get this, but I will say one of no, the things you just that have this to is know what a typewriter is. Well, one of the things that this is missing, though, I'm going to say, like if you were a fan of Dark Place, is a solid 50% of the humor of dark place is that it is a bunch of really competent people acting incompetent. Like the, the there's camera mistakes, editing mistakes, sound mistakes. Um, and all of them are done on purpose and all of them are very funny. And I think it's safe to say that that sort of thing is like the parody of an old soap opera is almost entirely Richard Ayoade, or at least heavily influenced by him. I think so. And the the character of Garth Marenghi seems to be Matthew Holness. So that seems to be where the line in their partnership sort of existed. So when you're reading this book, you're not going to get much of the like soap opera comedy. He doesn't really do a good job of parodying like the medium of books because there's a just not as much to do with that and and b i don't think people would get it yeah only only really smart really sexy buff dudes like us actually even read books so i can understand why there's such a big disconnect why i'm not going to lie if i could get a garth Marenghi's house of leaves <laughs> i think that would make my day <laughs> That's kind of what I'm looking for. That's that would replace the dark place experience for me, but I don't know how many people are aware of House of Leaves. Like if there's enough that people would even get that's what it's parodying. Do we do we need to make that happen next year at NaNoWriMo? We we do House of, House of Leaves. Words about leaves. Words about leaves. <laughs> leaves about books. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, 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 I mean, I can write some shit upside down. Yeah. So the Terror Tome itself. Let's talk about that. Uh, I was not expecting an anthology. Yeah, me neither. I also wasn't an expecting anthology. as much typewriter sex. So there's three distinct stories within the Terror Tome. Uh, I mean, I guess that's true, but they all are linked together. Well, yes, they have an Eden verse like. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Garth. Oh, um, yeah. If you're Eden verse like, then uh, no, uh, Garth, don't read our book. Don't don't read. Don't read that. It's on um, sale on Amazon for a yeah. dollar. <laughs> it's eternally on sale. <laughs> we need to write in, like another book that's just bullshit to put next to it. You know, like <laughs> when I worked at when I worked at Sears, we used to do that with lawnmowers. 
There was like one lawnmower that was 300 bucks and it was exactly the same as the lawnmower next to it, which was on sale for 200 bucks. <laughs> and that was just the price. The $300 one was there for profiling purposes. If you bought that, you were an idiot. Sorry, that was a scam. <laughs> and now Sears is where exactly? Uh, out of business. I think yeah, they yeah. just a catalog. They, I think they're somebody's doing something with Sears now. I don't know if they're back online only, like uh, like Bed Bath & Beyond got resurrected. Did it really? Yeah, they're uh, online only now. All right. Anyway. Anyway. So the first story, and I'm going to let you type this because, or, yeah, oh, God. I'm going to let you tell this. Sorry, it's Freudian slipping already. Yeah. Because uh, this is your fault. You uh, championed I'm this. S- I'm going to slip my Freudian in, into your story, baby. So tell me uh, about Garth Marenghi. He wrote this book for the last 40 years. He's, he starts talking about the content of the book, but then he stops. I thought that was funny. He's a former Grand Duke of Darkness, now Archduke. Uh, he had he saw a lethal virus, which I assume was COVID. I, I can't remember exactly, but he didn't have a publishing deal, so he couldn't tell the world about it. He calls podcasting not an art form. He's right, and uh, that that hurts me. Um, and he lost his publisher after assaulting him, his friends, his family's love, and his car. Okay. Okay, so I'm confused. Right off, like, right off the bat, I was confused. I did eventually sort it out. <laughs> the beginning, like, you right now, you're talking about Garth Marenghi, right? Yes, Garth Marenghi. We who are is not distinct talking about, yet yeah, Nick from, Steen is his character, yeah. who is also a writer. But Nick Steen is, like, super... Uh, talented and rich and he's got a family that he uh, he abuses and he's like super super talented and he's been publishing this entire time he's like if garth Marenghi had a publishing deal that's nick steen he's the idealized version (laughs) of garth Marenghi. it's literally the character of garth Marenghi, just called nick steen and he except i guess the bit is that garth Marenghi exists in our real world it's layers of satire. It's House of Leaves. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little better than House of Leaves. Oh, it's much better than House of Leaves. <laughs> so he's, the book starts with a mysterious secondhand shop. And he then talks a lot about words. It goes on for a while. Um, I took a note about the psychogeometric angles only he and Carl Sagan could perceive. I thought that was funny. That's a Lovecraft thing. And uh, then he starts hearing a voice inside this this uh, secondhand shop telling him to buy him. It's the, it's the typewriter. It takes a while for Nick, takes a while for Nick to realize <laughs> that it's the typewriter, even though it's very obvious. And he thinks he recognizes the the secondhand shop owner who is just going to town on some eels. Just, is that how you eat eels? I don't think I've ever eaten an eel just slurping it down. I've only ever eaten them barbecued at a sushi place. Yeah, me too. So, the machine changed places with a sex device from the Victorian times. And they're being weirdly sexual with, like, innuendo about the typewriter. And I thought, that's kind of funny. Not realizing <laughs> what, we were about to, what we were about to be witness to. I caught more horror movie references than horror novel references. Is that because but no one cares about horror novels, Ben? Quite possible. <laughs> Honestly. Like, quite possibly. Um... Did you get a, like, this could be any one of the, like, I think he does the stereotype and the accent of, like, a, like, the the Chinese mysterious shop owner. Moses Unique. Yeah. But he's doing this weird voice. And uh, I got Gremlins vibes, I guess. I'm going to say this, this, this reminded me of the scene from Gremlins where the guy buys a mogwai. Or the scene from Hellraiser. Where the guy buys a pain box. Well, there is a, there's definitely a Hellraiser scene later when the typewriter gets him. Okay, so he buys the typewriter from Moses Unique. Yeah. One year later, uh, my next note says his typewriter pounds his ass. <laughs> what the fuck am I listening to? Oh my god, is the next one after that. 
Uh, yeah. So he describes in vivid detail. I thought it was just going to be a one-off. Like, yeah, yeah. I no, got it's, railed by. Is... It is not. It is not a one-off. He he repeatedly talks about railing or really being railed by his typewriter. So there's a lot I don't know about typewriters. Going to get that out of the way up front. It would hurt. Yes. It would be incredibly many, painful. Many, to do the many of the things I don't know about typewriters um, are their parts. I understand there's a ribbon. Is that what ink is on? Yeah. I understand. Sure it pushes into the ribbon and that pushes onto the paper? Question mark, I think. Yeah, I don't know how. I don't know how typewriters work. I Yeah, it's because you didn't go full on hipster douche. I had a friend who bought a typewriter in an antique shop and used it a handful of times and then probably never again. I do write fiction longhand. Wow. A little bit of a hipster. Douche. But that's mostly because I my job is to stare at computers for like twelve hours a day. Then my hobby is to edit podcasts. So uh, I just I just don't want to look at a screen. But a lack of typewriter knowledge really makes these sex scenes just confusing. Because <laughs> the different parts of the typewriter go different places. Yeah. And and I don't know. Like so, there's All an obvious Hellraiser. There's an obvious Hellraiser reference where um, the typewriter can summon hooks and chains, like the Cenobites. They they go right after his nips, just every time. <laughs> and he and says it's very sensitive tissue yeah he's dragged by his nipples to type and the typewriter essentially what he, what it's making him do is uh write these these incredibly long books A so 12,000 page manuscript yeah they're depleting the earth's resources they they would uh destroy the amazon rainforest if we were to publish them and, and uh, his books aren't selling anymore, Ben. No one wants to buy the book. <laughs> and his and this is a the quote: female publisher Roz is advising him that the Clackett Publishing. I don't know if that is a reference to Hackett Publishing, which is a company <laughs> that that Clackett Publishing is going to have to let Nick go. And Nick is becoming increasingly isolated. That's because his, his female editor won't just publish the book as is and keeps trying to make changes, Ben. His books are brilliant and we just can't comprehend it. But his books are actually arcane symbols and nonsense languages. Yeah. And they're basically not written in English anymore. This one line is just a series of apostrophes and parentheses. Yeah. That's because you don't understand, okay? There was a programming language. I'm trying to remember what it was called. C sharp. Well, that is a programming language. Good job. <laughs> but no, I think it was called like brain fuck or something like that. <laughs> Sorry. What? Hang but on, this was language. intentional, I assume. It was a yeah, meme yeah. coding language. <laughs> yeah. It was a meme coding language. Uh <laughs> Brainfuck is an esoteric programming language created in 1993 by Urban Mueller. Notable for its extreme minimalism, the language consists of only eight simple commands, a data pointer, and an instruction pointer. While it is fully Turing complete, it is not intended for practical use, but to challenge and amuse programmers. Brainfuck requires one to break commands into microscopic steps. So it was basically designed to be unreadable by a human like more unreadable than binary it's actually more confusing <laughs> than just writing assembly code that's what this, this is me what of. they're the talking was... about in ready player two when they're talking about a, a coding language that has never been used before or never not not in the human language or something like that i'm going to send you a picture of brain fuck code you've written at least some code before right yeah have you do you ever uh like you're at a job interview and they're like, I need you to learn brain fuck. <laughs> it's really okay. important that you learn brain fuck to fit in around here. All right, let's see this. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, to display the AS, how do you say that? ASCI, ASC, 
CII character 7, we must add 48 to the value 7? What? We use the loop to compute 48 equals 6 times 8? So I just sent you uh, a sample of BrainFuck. This uh, would print Hello World. <laughs> this would print Hello World? <laughs> <laughs> okay that's that's pretty good um yeah because when you when you need to print hello world in another language you you can like usually just just write print hello world (laughs) yeah yeah, it's literally the easiest thing possible um wow that that is the easiest thing possible in brain fuck as well it's just less easy (laughs) um so he's essentially – so that was like I have no idea if he knows anything about this language, if he knows it existed or what. But like the way they were describing the way his books were coming out, it reminded me of BrainFuck. Like he was – he he describes – because like this is a line of BrainFuck code. Plus uh, left bracket dash dash. Uh, oh, my God. Man. <laughs> yeah. <Four. laughs> oh, my God. That <laughs> – that looks painful to even try. Yeah, no, you're right. It would be easier to just use zeros and ones at this point. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that's what that's what Garth is is uh, writing. Um, it's just yep, a bunch he's of writing symbols his books and brain fuck. And it's <laughs> yeah. Maybe <laughs> maybe if someone ran his books through a brain fuck compiler. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, yeah, Turing complete. Oh my god. All right. So, yeah, his books aren't selling. He's blaming the publisher. His even though his books are garbage, he he insists it's because it's just too radical. People don't understand his amazing books. This typewriter is magical and they do some magical stuff in the bedroom every night to generate thousands of pages of manuscript. I think my favorite scene, the thing that actually made me laugh the hardest was when he's author. on the f- oh. when he's on the phone with Roz and he hears the typewriter go get a shower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's when it just reached the point of absurdity where I was laughing. Like none of the sex stuff made me laugh. It was all it was a bit much. It was, a bit it was much. all trying a bit too hard. It went on a bit too long. And I think that's going to be my main complaint there, with all these stories one- is they there is one part that got me with the typewriter, but it is not in the first part of the story, actually. It's in the second part. Okay, so so tell me about the old writer. So, as the story goes along, he starts to think, like, I know this Moses unique guy, this, this ancient Chinese guy. And he remembers, there's an old author who, he died, Ben, so it couldn't possibly be the same person. And he's he spends most of his time on a commode, he's old as hell, and... and uh, I want to call him Garth, but it's not Garth, right? It's, it's uh, Nick. Nick. Nick Stain. Nick Stain. He basically tears his magnum opus manuscript up in front of this guy to get him off the commode and also let him know that his time is up, old man. And then he steals his last roll of toilet paper and, he, and the guy fucking dies. Um, the, he, is, the last thing Nick he sees is, is the, the man prying himself off the toilet, having to use the remains of his manuscript as toilet paper. Jesus Christ! Yeah. Also, yeah. he's vacuum sealed to the toilet somehow. I think that's what happened. Like he fell in. Yeah, and no one bothered. And again, to pull like him out. the crap they're putting on TV these days, right? Th- that that's that's just what goes through my mind. <laughs> he's he's doing that <laughs> stupid interview. <laughs> Like, well, they're just have you seen the shit they're putting on TV these days? I mean, it all just it's 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 just trash. It's just trash these days. He was sealed to the toilet, <laughs> having to use his own manuscript. Yeah, Garth has a lot of ridiculous books, like about skin disease monsters. And anyway, um, let's see. God, what do I even want to say about all this? The typewriter basically wants him to recruit Roz. That's his editor. And you have to mention him and Roz meeting at the skincare clinic. Yeah, they met at the skincare clinic, Ben. Well, yeah, but then they have a clandestine meeting at the skincare clinic. And she shares 
her triple antibiotic steroid cream with him. He immediately strips off his pants and begins applying the steroid cream to his nether regions, which is where the bulk of his chafing is. Yeah. And he also admits to Roz that he's been fucking a typewriter. But he does not recruit Roz to the typewriter scheme. And he has to go back and face the typewriter. And I think I think the almost an exact quote was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about not getting Roz. And the typewriter said, I'm sorry about your asshole. And uh, graphically destroys this man's nether regions. And that's how we get inside of his own brainscape, Ben. Anything you want to say outside of uh, like anything I may have skipped over? There was an entirely unnecessarily interview with a Satanist. Oh, yeah. I completely forgot about that. And I think I put it's just one note that says a psychic Satanist question mark. And that we moved on. Unimportant. So he gets trapped in his own mind, which is called the prolix. prolix. And in his own mind, he's doing battle with. The typewriter, who is actually an ancient eldritch being known as Typeface. Typeface and this is has where... type bars on his face and says too many words that all mean the same thing. <laughs> and uh, this is where they do the Hellraiser thing. So he's in, he's trapped in his own mind, and and there's constant breaks saying, um, basically making. F- uh, I don't want to say making fun, though, but they're they're basically uh, giving content warnings, which are real content warnings because what follows is actually like graphic descriptions of stuff. But they're giving content warnings in a funny way where he's like calling the audience cowards and such. But then also he's making fun of the people who bother to read it. So there's you, you really can't win either way. You, the audience, are an idiot. And, uh, he, he is like basically the, the whole Frank from Hellraiser treatment. I'm already scarring you with all the typewriter sex. So I'll, I'll spare you, but it actually does get gory. I mean, they, they flay him essentially. Yeah. They strip him down to like a brain. And, um, eventually Roz enters his mind somehow and the book does make fun of how convoluted this whole thing gets. Uh, but it's a lot of like just long description of, of torture and, and stuff like that. And then uh, him patting himself on the back for what like a, an edgy groundbreaking horror writer he is for having just written all that all that torture stuff. And then Roz comes in and they run from the, the prolix. Uh, at this point, he's just a pile of sludge. I like how after he he gets flayed, he says he was salted. The pain was beyond description and won't be described. (laughs) It gave me some Lovecraft. uh... (laughs) 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 A more self-aware Lovecraft. Uh... Well, yeah, I do think. I do think that is what he's going for. And uh, Roz scoops him up. I think they eventually escape. I don't. I mean, there's yeah, a lot they, of like running they throw through some, the void. Some correction fluid on him, which I assume is white out. And uh, there's an erotic section where he's a gross piece of dice meat, and he goes to town on her. But that was actually all just in his head. Thank God. Um, there's a but lawnmower in his and head. sprinkler metaphor that goes on way too long, and they escape from behind his fridge back into the real world. And also, he's slowly turning into. God, letterhead. Yes. And he tells Ross to point my eyes in a specific direction in case I need to relate this to someone later. Um, and uh, they they put the end on Typeface, which defeats him. But as he's dying, he reaches out and squeezes Nick's brain. And then dies, presumably. Yeah, and so uh, in the first episode of Dark Place... To set up for what would ostensibly have been a long-running series, there is a character who uh, had gone insane and was holding back the gates of hell 
with his uh, with the last shred of his of his sanity. And Garth walks in to check on this man, and when he does, the man explodes. <laughs> And that unleashes all of the demons that supposedly haunt the the dark place. So in this book, uh, Garth Marenghi has written hundreds of horror novels, each more terrifying than the last. And And more groundbreaking than the last. And more groundbreaking, sometimes literally. Yeah. And so when, when they squeeze his brain, all the ideas come out into the real world. (gasps) But that's where I I live. I don't know if um, like that's that's the setup for the rest of the book. Like that's the through line is now Garth is is battling all of his escaped ideas to yeah. put them put them down. I don't know if that's what the new book is about as well. If we if this is just like the the content machine he's building. Um, <laughs> well, let's find out. <laughs> so I'm trying to remember. The next one is Bride of bone yeah um okay so this one gave me big uh there's a couple of different movies they're doing here but the the two big ideas i think he was pulling from were halloween the john carpenter movie the first one not any of the terrible sequels and reanimator which is which sounds horrible it could either be the lovecraft story or the movie based on the lovecraft story (laughs) Reanimator is like a cult classic. It has some of the like weirdest special effects. Uh, Barbara Crampton's in it, I think. And so the the two ideas that are fused are if you've ever watched Halloween, there is like to a comical degree the world's worst therapist. Just try to understand what we're dealing with here. Don't underestimate it. Don't you think we could refer to it as him? If you say so. Ever portrayed on film. He is a Michael Myers psychologist who was working on him or working with him. <laughs> at the, so he uh, did a real good job. <laughs> well, this is the thing. So like all his lines are like, he's evil, evil, I tell you, evil incarnate. I spent the first 14 years of my career trying to help him. And then I spent the next 14 trying to make sure he'd never see the light of day. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. Oh, that's uh, that's the Italian man in this. Yes. <laughs> And so the the Dr. Loomis is the guy from Halloween. Dr. Loomis then takes his gun and goes to Haddonfield to, a, you know, shoot his patient. And that's exactly what this guy's doing. <laughs> and he has that same attitude of like, he calls all his patients crazies and he hates them. And the whole reason he became a talk therapist was to get closer to this guy <laughs> to kill him. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> I appreciated that. Like, as a horror movie fan, I appreciated this parody. I didn't get that reference at all, <laughs> but I had fun with it. So so this one is, there's, um, it's not Michael Myers that escaped. It's another maniac, kind of a a Frankenstein, the, the doctor type dude who, he doesn't reanimate, I mean, he does reanimate dead tissue, but not just dead tissue. He reanimates... A vascular necrosis, necrosis. <laughs> which often comes from like clothing being worn too tight, which restricts blood flow and causes the bones to die. Is that real? Uh, I don't know if it mostly comes from clothing. Uh, I I know someone who there was just a weird blood supply issue. They couldn't figure out why exactly, but uh, basically the bone died inside their body and so they had to do some surgery to remove all that dead tissue actually it happened to my uh taekwondo instructor oh wow he had uh i was taught taekwondo by a man with fake hips 
Yeah, I've heard. I've seen. I most of the avascular necrosis I've seen has been hip related. Yeah, yeah. I'm lo- I'm looking at uh, risk factors. None of them have anything to do with your fucking clothing being too tight. I think in order to compress the bone that much, you would need to like cut off the circulation. To so everything. I don't know. I I don't want to be this guy. I don't want to be the joke police. Okay. Yeah, you do. But I do kind of. So I, the 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 bit in this one is that the Frankenstein doctor has found he he's been selling shoes to ladies that are two sizes too small, causing uh-huh. the blood flow to be restricted to their toes, and then he has to cut off their toes. Yeah. And when he cuts off their toes, he can reanimate them, and he can make an army of bone people. Yeah. Are you gonna point out how the timeline doesn't make sense? <laughs> uh, the timeline's fine. Uh. Does, I feel like it? the shoe the shoe is bit this? came directly from like an IT crowd sketch. There is a bit in the IT crowd about the shoes. Is that a thing with ladies? Maybe maybe that's just a, like a common stereotype. I have never dated anyone who did that, but maybe maybe across the pond, that's a thing. Do women go for shoes that are too small for them? And just kind of like shove their foot in there and hope for the best. Is that like a beauty standard thing? Is it desirable to have? But how I did guess, how did she get these feet? shoes before seemingly all the all the terrible demon things escaped? Or did this happen months later? I thought this was like almost immediately after. There's not a, a clear delineation the next story takes place months later the one after this for sure but this one doesn't really have a clear timeline it takes place some days later i guess um so i don't really have a lot to say about this one well the the bulk of this is him going around with the dr loomis character and exchanging punchy dialogue yeah capello the italian man he he who has the realizes, world's most wildly inconsistent accent. He realizes that he is not real. But god damn it, this is all real to him. He lost a brother and a, a soon-to-be sister-in-law to the crazy doctor... Was it Steen? Because I, I feel like... Stain! Dr. Stain? It was very close to Nick Steen, right? It was the same initials. Yeah, so yeah, because that was a bit. So they they exchange one liners and and punchy dialogue, and they go after Roz, who has been captured by this evil doctor, and then they get captured. They put really tight speedos on them to to necros them, and then they're gonna be dipped into a vat of acid at the wedding, and she fell in love with a a skeleton who happens to be the Italian man's brother and uh, yada, yada, yada escape happens. And Capello has this brave heroic moment and takes all of them down with him. So this story, (laughs) so yeah, I was going to say like all of these stories, it's, it's, it's toughy because like we normally do detailed summaries so that we could talk about specific things. But in this case, what made this story work was the jokes and without yeah, I, did, just... I did like this story a lot more than the uh, fucking a typewriter thing. Although, yeah. okay, this is where it comes up again, Ben. They're in those speedos, and and Nick is like, "You gotta think of something hot to get the blood flowing down there." And Capello's like, "I can't, I can't." And, he, and Nick is like, "Should I tell him about my weird, my weird kinkiness with the typewriter?" He's like, "Hey, Capello, you ever, you ever just see like a, a set of keys on a?" fresh typewriter or whatever and Capello's like what the fuck are you talking about i laughed at that that was where that was the one time it it worked for me ben <laughs> i laughed at that <laughs> solid review yeah i was gonna say with that like it's genuinely funny like you might as well read it there's there's really no point in us describing this one to you there's not a lot of plot to this um it it flowed pretty well. This was this was a decent this was a decent middle. So I would say I liked the first story, I liked the second story. I liked the the second story the most. 
I think the first story was kind of touch and go for a while. I like the second story the most. I think the first story kind of needed to establish some things. But yeah, the second story, the it, it, it comes to a, a, a high in the middle. And then the third story... Uh, <laughs> Oh, it's Nelson really? Strain. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, the third story. So the third story, I don't know how you're going to feel about this. For me, this one felt like, and then a third thing. Yeah, because... it, did, it did feel like, uh, <laughs> the second story felt like it flowed from the first story, and the third story felt like we needed some more pages. So here's a yeah. short story, and I kind of tuned out. For a little bit, um, there's a psychic dugong that's supposed to sound like Liam Neeson, and he doesn't. And nope. um, the the dark fraction is like a, a doppelganger that's a darker version of, of him that's also psychically connected to him. But then that doppelganger has another doppelganger that's even darker, etc., 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 etc. There's a whole bunch of them, and they're multiplying at an insane rate. And apparently the way to destroy them is to burn all the books which were unreleased so they're in a warehouse. Which doesn't... And as and I mean, they pointed out, I did laugh at the end, uh, the the Roz falls in love with uh, the Nickstein doppelganger and they're at a big vat again and she's like, yeah, if, I, if this were one of your books, I'd point out that this is the same formulaic trash... As your last story, where I'm kidnapped by one of the guys, we fall in love, and there's a big vat and a showdown. Yeah, I guess, it, yeah, it is one of those, uh, if, well, if you say it, I can't make fun of it. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, yeah, this one, I mean, it wasn't bad, but... It just wasn't good. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll put it this way. W- uh, uh, I almost would have rearranged the stories a little. <laughs> like, I wouldn't have ended with this. Yeah, no, this this could have been the second one. Yeah, if maybe if this was in the three. middle, I, I would have liked it better. Like, because when this is what... I don't know if anybody else gets this way, but like when you're getting towards the end of a book, you either... It, it either becomes a slog or you finish it all in one go. And this was like... This was this was nearing slog, where I was like, yeah. yeah. So the the entire story was based around the idea that Throppelganger is funny to say, and that got old real fast. <laughs> and also, I in print, I have to imagine this barely works, probably because because it really seemed like in the audio book he was trying to showcase like a range of voice work and uh i he doesn't have he doesn't he doesn't have a lot of range um <laughs> the the liam neeson thing that that seemed like a joke <laughs> that okay, one definitely so, does not work in print so the joke is that the uh, there is a psychic dugong that is nick steen's best friend from childhood uh, and his mental voice, his his inner monologue sounds exactly like Liam Neeson. It's just him trying to do Liam Neeson voice. I think it's him. I can't really tell. It Okay, Liam Neeson is Irish. And he doesn't have... A, he either does not like a kind of American accent sometimes. Or he just doesn't have a very strong Irish accent. At least to my ear when he's when he's in most movies and so what (laughs) what is coming out as the liam neeson voice kind of just sounds like an american accent but it doesn't like liam neeson like rounds his vowels still in in that like irish way kind of and it, it just doesn't every once in a while it sounds like liam neeson i don't know if somebody told him he had like a really good liam neeson like it it would be good if you were in like an SNL sketch and you had a costume and you had like the little goatee or something that he had in Batman, like, I don't know if you somehow looked like Liam Neeson, I would get it. 
But if you hadn't told me Liam Neeson, I would have just thought you were doing some weird, like, American action movie accent. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not good, Ben. I, I agree. <laughs> I'm trying to describe it for the people. Not. I don't know if it's him. I, I can't tell. It doesn't sound that that is the voice that stands out. I can tell you that. I don't know if you got a friend who somebody told him he has a great Liam Neeson. I think the real test of an impression is if I close my eyes and you don't tell me who you're doing an impression of, will I know? I'm doing an impression of Liam Neeson right now, Ben. This is my Liam Neeson voice. <laughs> I'm doing an <laughs> impression of Liam Neeson. That's that's the, that's all that's it the is. thing that ties together the House of Leaves. Liam Neeson? Yeah. The Garth Marenghi House of Leaves. That's That's what it needs. What? Man, this really is like House of Leaves, because I don't know what the <laughs> fuck you're talking about. It's going to be his next book, Ben. Oh. House of, House of Garth. House of Dugongs. Yeah, a weird psychic dugong. Um, but again, it's another thing like it, it, dugong is a funny word. Thropple ganger is a funny word. Uh, Throp your ganger. But yeah, yeah this, this was the weakest. I, yeah, I, I, I agree. This. Okay, so... Nate, I think I, I I don't think there's any point faffing about, as the Brits would say. Uh, uh, I think uh, we might as well just get get right into the rubric. All right, content and ideas, mm-hmm. Ben. Okay, well now I said I didn't want to faff about, but like I don't have the rubric up like right this freaking second. <laughs> well, you're fucking up then. Get that rubric up. I need a little. I mean, I need a, I need a minute. No, absolutely God. not. Hang on, you're you're a machine. We just use you for content. Okay, content and ideas. I think I'm going to go with a four. Okay, I can work I don't, with that. Yeah, I mean, I think we now have a few people doing the pompous fictional author writing uh, parody novels, but... Um, I, you know, Garth Marenghi was technically around before Cecil H. H. Mills, and I'm sure there's more of them, but I haven't seen anything like this for horror. I liked it. I think the parody stories parodied a lot of things in horror that fans of the genre would recognize and, and get a kick out of. And it. I didn't. <laughs> but I think you still enjoyed it, right? Yeah, it was all right. So what I, I, I think I, yeah, I was, I was trying to go between a three or a four. Um, I could see a three because I don't think there's a lot original here. I'm kind of leaning towards a three just because, look, you're, you're going to do three stories. You have to develop all of them. And that last story was, eh, eh. So I have to weigh that against, it. I'm going to give it a three. I'm going to give it a three. I think that's, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I'm going to be, I'm going to be the nice horror guy. I like, I just like people writing in my genre. Boo. All right, organization. I'm gonna go with a three. Yeah, that's the three. pacing was <laughs> sometimes too fast. A lot of times, like a little slower. He said, than he said something in the uh, in the interview that that was interesting. I think the the guy interviewing him asked if he read any of those old pulpy horror paperbacks, and he said yes. And he asked if uh, he liked them, and he said. Yeah, you know, having written a book, realizing what it takes to write a book, that uh, writing is real work, and the people that were churning these out, even though they were kind of trashy and it's easy to pick on them, like, he had a whole new respect for the amount of actual human effort that goes into just finishing a book, and I felt that in his pacing. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> I... I, I and I don't, I, I I mean that kind of as a joke, but like that third story, it really did feel like, oh, I got to finish it. But I'm going to tell you what, it wasn't so bad that I wouldn't read another of his books. And it was better to just get something out than nothing. But yeah, it's still paced a little too slow. Use of language, Ben. You know, I think I'm going to give him a five. Oh my God. Wow, yeah. I was just going to go with a four. I think I'm going to give him a five. I think that is his like strongest aspect. He he has a really good sense of wordplay. He has a good sense of comedic timing. He 
like he i do think he uses the english language like an instrument i i it's, it ain't shakespeare you know i'm i mean this is a five within its within its genre but he has a voice and um yeah i think i i think whatever this guy writes would be funny it's just i think the plot is where he kind of lost a lot but i think the style is there all right ben well shit personal preference i'm actually going with a three but it sounds like you probably went with four or five i did i went with a four. Oh my god you enjoyed it more than i did you're welcome ben <laughs> you're welcome you know through this i sat down and i watched all of uh dark place i read this book i'll probably read his next book i did like it and i did find a new thing i liked um the elements that didn't quite work for me the third, third story is a little weak um I do get the vibe he's finding his footing in this space of horror parody, but uh, I see promise. I like what I see. I don't think I'd pay to see his book tour, but I will pay for his book. All right. Recommendation strength. I will give that a four. Yeah, I think four is where it belongs. I, I think you do need to be a bit of a horror fan to get the most out of this, and I think that's probably... A the difference between us. horror fan. Ew. Well, I think like this, I'll put it this way. This to me, the plotting, <laughs> and this is, this, this feels tough to say, but the, the plotting of the, uh, Cecil H.H. H. Mills books is a bit better. The language oh, yeah. is a bit worse in my opinion. Uh, it's just not as good, but yeah, I think if I think, you like mystery books. You have experience with those old kids' mysteries, and that parody really clicks for you. I think if you had been as into horror as I am, this would have clicked for you more, but that's a limitation. Okay. Well, it sounds like you gave it four stars. I gave it... I think see. I gave it 60... 60. <laughs> I'm gonna do this in my. I'm gonna do this in my head. So six. I gave it sixty-seven plus points. Twenty is thirty-six plus fifteen is fifty-one plus fifteen is sixty-six. That can't be right. You scored mm-hmm. it higher than me in like every category. No, 76. I was off by 10. Yeah. Like, there's no way he scored it less than I did. Four stars. I think I'd I think I'd check it out if you're in the mood for a horror comedy novel. I definitely liked Dark Place more, but you know. Dark Place, uh, yeah. I think the half of the fun of Dark Place is the soap opera stuff. And none of that is here. There there is basically no supporting cast. You don't get the publisher you don't get the other doctor you don't get the late i mean you get raws all right anything else no i think this was this this was an easy one you want to do okay. the um having having thoroughly dissected in our intellectual fashion in the dark place not the dark place garth Marenghi's terror town i guess we should do the patreon shout outs oh yeah that's that's a thing we need to do <laughs> Okay, so we are going to shout out. I have this list in my in my brain noodle, by the way. I never read All this. Alright. Jamie of the If You Want the Gravy blog, where he reviews everything. But this past week, I guess at the time I'm saying this, but maybe not true when it comes out. He reviewed FNAF, the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, upon my request. I'm sorry, Jamie. Yeah, I'm kind of sorry, too. <laughs> but it was, it was funny, though. And um, so check that out. We have John Bierce, author of the Mage Errant series. And John Bierce also has a Patreon where he posts his short stories. You should check it out. We have Spooky Shy, who did a Five Nights at Freddy's episode with me. Check that out if you haven't. And we have Isekai Sensei Sama. 
Sama. Of. Is that how you say it? <laughs> Esikai <laughs> Sensei Sam. Esikai Sensei <laughs> Sama. Uh, of the. That time I got reincarnated in the same world as an anime podcaster podcast. I don't think I've forgotten anyone. No, I don't think you did either. So, if you did, you yeah. can add them in post. Yeah. Nate, do you wanna you wanna give me some uh some some poetry about typewriter lovemaking to play us out? Yeah. Get some band aids, put them on your nips. You're gonna wanna protect those bad boys. Because typewriters don't show any mercy and uh they will they will destroy you. And your butthole.